So please welcome Catherine Winch. Thank you for having me. It is an honor to be able to share my broken and busted up story <laughs> and uh, my journey from being broken to now being whole. And my story of brokenness can be summarized pretty well by a trip that I took to the chiropractor four years ago. So for my entire life, I experienced chronic back pain, brought on by everything from uh, being a competitive gymnast when I was a little girl, to having a job that required me to be on airplanes all the time, to constantly carrying around two cranky, heavy children. Uh, but despite being in pain for as long as I can remember, I never did anything about it. I assumed it was perfectly normal. I assumed that everybody in the world walked around with chronic back pain. And I also assumed that it was perfectly acceptable to be in pain on the inside but walk around with a smile on my face on the outside. But luckily, four years ago, I was on a girls' weekend, and uh, I was laying on the floor kind of cracking and stretching my back, which was a regular habit for me. And one of my girlfriends said, what the hell is wrong with you? Why are you doing this? And I was like, oh, it's totally normal. My back hurts every day, and uh, this really helps me. And she's like, you need to go see a damn doctor. What is wrong with you? So she insisted that I go see her chiropractor. She made the appointment for me. So four days later, I find myself in the chiropractor's office. And as I watched the chiropractor examine the x-ray of my spine, I watched his eyes get really big. And I was like, what's up, doc? <laughs> what's wrong? And he said, I have three things to tell you, Catherine. Your spine is incredibly out of alignment. You must be in a tremendous amount of pain, and it's going to take a lot of work to get it back together. And I was thinking, I'll be the judge of this, how much work this is gonna take and how much pain that I'm in. And then he turned his computer screen around so that I could see the x-ray of my spine and I burst into tears in that moment because it was the perfect metaphor for my life. And it was the story of my life. On the outside, my life looked so polished, so put together, so impressive to so many people, but on the inside, I was always exhausted. And I was often in pain trying to live up to this idealized version of myself that I created in my own head and that I projected out into the world on a regular basis. So the experience of the chiropractor hit me like a ton of bricks because I saw in that situation what I needed to see in my own life. I was in a lot of pain. My life was completely out of alignment. My insides did not match my outsides. And I knew that it was going to take a lot of work to get it back together. So how did my brokenness come about and how did my um, life get so out of alignment? Long story short, it was years and years of overachievement in every way, shape, and form imaginable that eventually landed me with a pretty massive career. So my people-pleasing skills worked. Uh, they worked so well, in fact, that early on in my career at the Martin Agency, I was tapped to help lead a team of people responsible for $42 million in business when I was 30 years old and pregnant with my first child. So let the misalignment begin. Uh, the, my achievements always felt great on the surface, but they were always temporary and they were never enough. I was always chasing, I was always rushing, I was always exhausted, and I never felt like I was good enough. It was always fleeting. But I put on a smile for 14 years, and I pretended like I was happy, and I acted like I was happy. And what I ended up doing, I now know, is that I was putting my essential self aside, and I was living my life through my social self. 
And my social self was the part of me that learned to value the things that the people around me valued. And I was really good at it. I was masterful at it. I knew exactly what mattered to the people around me. So if Renee valued profit margin, I would figure out how to drive it. And if Mike valued creativity, I would figure out how to grow it. And if Beth valued deadlines, I would stay up all night long for weeks at a time to knock a project out of the park, mostly to just have the work killed <laughs> um, pretty soon after. But I was really good at it. I was really good at being who other people wanted me to be. I was really good at it. And in most people's eyes, I had it all. I had the job, I had the title, I had the trophies, I had the salary, and maybe I did. But if I had it all, I hated it. It wasn't me. I had ended up at the top of this mountain, and what I realized is that when I got to the, amount, the top of the mountain, I hated the view. It wasn't me, I hated the view. I climbed for years, for 14 years, working my ass off all day, every day. And I got to the top and I was like, I arrived. I'm like, what is this shit? This looks terrible. <laughs> I'm so unhappy. And what I realized is that you can be successful and unhappy at the same time. And people can't buy that, and people can't believe that. So when I would walk around and I started to open up and say, I'm really not happy, I'm really tired and angry all the time. And people would look at me like, my, 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 Catherine, what does it take to make you happy if you have all this and you're not happy? And I was like, I don't know what it's gonna take, but this ain't it. I do not like the view from the top of this mountain. And so I got off the mountain. And what I did was I spent an entire year on a very deep self-help journey. And in true female fashion, I watched every episode of Oprah. I drank a lot of red wine. I would just cry on my couch at night drinking red wine, watching Oprah. My husband's like, I think I'm gonna go watch TV in the bedroom. <laughs> Seems really sad. And I started devouring, probably not at the same clip as Grant's reading, but um, I started devouring self-help books. It's the only genre of books that I read. It makes my husband crazy. Whenever we go on vacation, I'm like writing furiously in my self-help books, and he always says, why can't you just read trashy romance novels like most women? What is wrong with you? But I spent a whole year learning about myself and what makes me happy, what fills me up with energy, what drains me and depletes me, and I finally took control of my life. And I took control of my ambitions, I took control of my, like, what I wanted to be in this world, I quit my job, I quit defining success by other people's terms, I started doing yoga, I started meditating, I started my own company, I even started eating broccoli and tofu, which is crazy. I ate chicken dinners and french fries my entire life. I never took care of myself, I never exercised, but once I got my life back in alignment, I started caring about myself and I started taking uh, better care of uh, myself and, and all of my habits. And what I realized was I didn't want to be on that mountain anymore and I found the courage to just jump off of it and get off of that mountain and I put my big girl pants on and I climbed a different mountain. And four years later, I can say that I am no longer broken. I am 100% whole. I am 100% in alignment, meaning who I am on the inside and what I deeply care about and what makes me happy is 100% represented in my actions and everyday behaviors. And what I realized was with my former life was that I was an actor on a stage and I was pretending to love a life that I built not for me, but for other people to be proud of me. And there is a big difference. 
And if you are leading your life and running your life to impress other people or make other people proud of you, it is a path to nowhere happy. And you will be so exhausted so frequently. So what I want to share with you is, um, as part of my journey, there are five lies that I finally stopped believing. And these were lies that, for as long as I can remember, I bought into lock, stock, and barrel. And I believed them, and I went after them, and um, I came to find out that <laughs> They're, they're lies. <laughs> Everybody was lying to me, and, and I believed it. So I want to take you through um, these lies in hopes that you'll figure them out a lot faster than I did and um, can start living a more whole life. So the first lie is that rejection sucks. Uh, when I was a, a little girl, I wanted to go to the University of Virginia so badly. I had my sight set on UVA for as long as I can remember, and I painted this picture in my head of me sitting out on the lawn and having all these friends and living in Charlottesville. And so I applied to early admission at UVA, and they were like, ha, ah, no, you're not coming. You're definitely not getting in early admission. I was like, okay, well, I'll definitely get in like regular admission. No, I didn't got rejected and ended up going to JMU, which was my second choice, and ended up having a wonderful time at JMU, met lifelong friends, and I also met my husband at JMU, who is a remarkable human being, Richard Winch. We have lots of fun together. But re regardless of the fact that I met this amazing human being there, which I obviously would not have met if I went to UVA, I still carried around the rejection for 10 years. I still felt like I was not smart enough to get into UVA and that JMU was my second choice and I carried it around until the night that Richard proposed to me, I put my head down on the pillow and I sat up in bed and I was like, thank God I didn't get into UVA. Oh my God, like I hadn't connected the dots that had I gotten what I wanted, I would never have met this amazing human being. And, um, and he's mostly amazing because every guy I ever dated before him was a raging loser. Like, <laughs> like of the biggest magnitude, you cannot, I would show you pictures, but you would never have any faith in me. And, um, and I probably would have continued down that path. And so when you think about your own life, there are points in time when you have been rejected, you will continue to be rejected. And nine times out of 10, there is a reason for it. And there is a silver lining in that rejection. Now, it's easy for me to look back on this rejection and say, oh no, it was cool. I met this great guy and we have two great kids together. But now I apply this to my daily life in the present moment not in the future. So as an example, I'm writing a self-help book for mothers right now. Latest toll is that it's been rejected by 13 publishers. And every time it gets rejected, I say, I know this is happening for a reason, and I know when I get a publishing contract that I will say, thank God it didn't happen in the summer of 2016 for whatever reason. I have faith that it's gonna happen. So rejection does not always suck. The second lie that I um, stopped believing was this notion that bigger is better. So, um, and I mean this in terms of your career and what you're going after. So, I was born and raised in Richmond, Virginia, and I love Richmond, Virginia. And even when I was a little girl, I never believed that I had to leave my hometown in order to have a very successful career. I felt like I could have both. But everybody thought I was crazy. When I was at the VCU Brand Center, they said, you know, write down the list of internships, cities that you want to go to, agencies you want to go to. And I said, I want to go to the Martin Agency. And I left all the other blanks, I left everything else blank. 
immediately was called in my professor's office, like, what the hell is wrong with you? And I said, I want to live in Richmond. And he said, that's great. Then this summer, you should go to San Francisco. And I said, no, I want to live in Richmond. And they was like, oh, God, what is wrong with you? And then my whole career, I would get calls from headhunters. We had this big job with a corner office and living in this city, brighter lights, more money. And I was like, my family lives in Richmond, Virginia. And I believe that I can have a great career. And I don't think bigger is better. I think the bigger the company, the harder it is. I think the more people that work for you, the more headaches that you have. Like, I don't buy it. I like small and intimate. So I've been fighting on this front for probably 15 years. Everybody thought I was crazy. But it is paying off in such wonderful, wonderful ways. So last week, my father was the mystery reader in my six-year-old son's class. Like, this makes me want to lose my mind. Like, this is my life and this is my everything. And I couldn't have that if I lived in New York or Chicago, if I was chasing money or chasing titles. Like, this is a really good life. And lo and behold, I ended up with a great corner office after all. <laughs> and it's in Carytown. And I believe the small things matter. And I think it is a lie to think that happiness is always going to be found in a bigger office or in a bigger city. It just isn't true for me at all. The third lie is um, this notion that women can't have it all. And this is such an exhausting conversation. You know, the cover of the Atlantic magazine, you know, why women can't have it all. And I'm like, wow, it's awfully pessimistic. <laughs> Jesus. And um, what I love about men is men don't have these conversations. So I write a blog, uh, a, a blog regularly. It's called In All Honesty. And I wanted to write about this issue. So I went to my husband and I said, you know that age old question, like can women have it all? And he was like, no. <laughs> I, I have no idea what you're talking about. I was like, it's like everybody talks about it. this big tension. Like can we, can we, should we, shouldn't we? He's like, nope, don't know what you're talking about. And I was like, well, do you think you have it all? And he was like, what's the definition of all? And I was like, you know, the house, the wife, the career, the kids. He's like, do I have a wife and a house and a career? Like, yeah, I guess I have it all. And I'm like, <laughs> God, I wish I could be like you. I think about this all day, every day. But what I believe about having it all, it is 100% possible to have it all. But first, you must know what your own all is. And when I was broken, I had everybody else's all. I had my mom's all, my dad's all, my grandmother's all, the school teacher's all, my children's all. I had everybody's all, which is why I was so damn tired all the time. But I had it all and I hated it because it wasn't my all. So when I went through this self-help journey, I very quickly started to realize what my own all was. So when I was starting the mom complex, there were lots of questions. Should it be big? Should it be small? Should it be in New York? Should we have offices in Chicago? Should it be franchised around? I didn't know what I wanted to be. But my remarkable business partner, John Kemper, wave John. He said, I'm going to help you figure out this company, but I'm not going to help you till you figure out what your end game is. Like, what is your all? Why are you doing this? And so the, the metaphor was, as an entrepreneur, I was often advised, think of yourself as a chef in a restaurant. You're making a product, and your only job is to figure out what type of restaurant that you want to be the chef in. So do you want to be the chef at Applebee's? And at first I was like, no, I'm eating tofu now. I'm not going to eat at Applebee's. <laughs> And, uh, but then, you know, the thought was, well, you laugh, but that chef is coming up with recipes. Everybody else is doing the work, and he's printing cash and probably lives on an island somewhere. And I was like, okay, we can consider that. And, um, or do you want to be the chef at the Four Seasons? And in that moment, I said, I want to be the chef at Millie's. Millie's is small and intimate and delicious and really high quality and they've never expanded. Don't you think that people have gone to Millie's time and time again and said, this is a great thing you got going, you should open up a restaurant in Charlotte. And don't you think that every time the owners of Millie's said, no, we're happy, we work in a shack. 
and it's really small and we only have seating for 35 people and if you want to wait we'll serve you a mimosa but we're not building the deck on the back and we're not opening up in short pump like this is where we are and we're okay with that and it became my guiding force as an entrepreneur and when people came to me and said you should open an office in chicago we'll open it for you and i would say millie's doesn't have a restaurant in chicago <laughs> not going to do it. So like clear as day. So you have to figure out what your own all is. This is not everybody's all. Most people look at my career and think I took a massive step back leaving the Martin agency and running a company called the Mommy Complex. <laughs> and I'm like, that's so patronizing. It's not the Mommy Complex, but I don't care because it's my Millie's and it's everything to me, but it's only because it's finally my own all. The fourth lie is that this notion that a balanced life is the good life. And balance is bullshit. It is a terrible goal um, to chase. First of all, it's not this seesaw relationship that everybody pretends like it is. Like, oh, am I balancing my work life and my home life? It really looks like this, if we're being honest. Like, who has two things to balance, you know, in their lives this morning? I'm like racing my kids to camp, yelling at them like, mommy's got to be somewhere. And then my daughter's like, your dress is so old fashioned. I'm like, I hate you. <laughs> and then my husband's like, you better hope the electricity is on at camp or you're taking kids to your speech. And I'm like, what? <laughs> And then he's like, and you better hope the lights are on where you're going to speak. And I'm like, God, I hate everybody. This is so stressful. So this is really what it's like, let's be honest. But what's crazy about this model is that it's externally focused. So everything that we are balancing or attempt, attempting to balance are the wants and needs of other human beings. So are my children happy? Is my husband happy? Is the camp counselor happy? And what a manic way to live. And don't you think that even if you are balanced that 30 seconds later, you're not going to be balanced? So I was having a really good balanced day the other day. And then my daughter's school called. She's eight years old. And they said, Layla has lice and you need to come pick her up immediately. And I'm like, what the? I'm busy. And they're like, she has to leave school premises right now. And I'm like, so much for the balance. <laughs> my day just went to shit, like really fast. <laughs> And so it's no way to live uh, trying to be balanced. So I think as a society, we should move away from acts of balance and more towards acts of wholeness. And what makes you feel like a whole human being? What fills you up with energy? What are the activities that you do that when you finish them, you say, I can get through another day. <laughs> I can keep going. For me, it's yoga and meditation. When after I meditate or after I go to yoga, I'm like, I got this down, I can keep going no matter what the world throws at me. I feel like I'm not gonna fall apart. But it's hard to get those things on your calendar. It's really hard. And if you look at your calendar today and for Monday, it's probably pretty full. And that's when we all start making excuses. I can't make time for myself because my calendar is already full. I say three months from now, your calendar is not already full it's probably pretty blank. So what I do is I set reoccurring meetings three months in advance. So after you leave today's session, you should go home, figure out what are the one or two things that fill your cup up and put them on your calendar for September because your calendar is not full. And then what happens is when September rolls around, all the other meetings and all the other crap that you have to do fills up the calendar, but they fill up around the big rocks because you've put the big rocks in first and it'll be kind of magical. September will show up, you'll start doing these behaviors and you'll go, I feel like a whole person and I didn't really have to do anything different. <laughs> it just magically happened. And the metaphor is if you put the grain of sands and if you put the grains of sand or the little pebbles in the glass first, the big rocks, the things that make you whole, will not fit. But if you put the big rocks in first, I promise you, all the other crap, 
all the other meetings, all the other grains of sand actually and physically do fit in the glass. And I still do just as much for my children, just as much for my job, just as much for my husband, even though I'm doing so much more for myself than I've ever done before. It works, it's magical, it'll change your life. The last lie is um, to ignore what other people think of you. So we spend so much time worrying about if other people like us, what they think of us, and my philosophy now is you need to worry about what you think of you. And for 35 years of my life, I didn't even know what I thought about myself because I cared so deeply about what other people thought of me. And my research has shown that there is a direct correlation between how you feel about yourself and how you talk to yourself or speak to yourself. So everybody has a voice in their head. And if you think that you don't have a voice in your head, then when I said that, you prob a voice in your head probably said, I don't have a voice in my head, which <laughs> obviously means that you have a voice in your head because everybody does. But I want you to start paying attention and listening to how cruel and mean the voice in your head is. So typically, the soundtrack in someone's mind is basically saying, why can't you get your shit together? Why are you always late? Why are you doing this? Why can't you not burn a frozen pizza? It's this mean, cruel, condescending voice in your head. And um, a wonderful, wonderful self-help book called Untethered Soul. Uh, Michael Singer, the author, talks about if you extracted that voice from your head and you, it turned it into a human being, and that human being followed you around all day, every day, and said to you the things that you say to yourself, you wouldn't last a day. You wouldn't make it. And you certainly would not listen to that human being. But because it's inside of you and it's your voice, not only do we listen to the voice, but we kneel at the altar of the voice in our head. So you can hear the voice. You can never really get it to go away completely. You can hear the voice, but it doesn't mean you have to listen to it. And it doesn't mean that you have to buy into it. And there are ways, if you stay in the present moment, that the voice will attack you less. So if you start paying attention to the voice in your head, 100% of the time, it is attacking you for something you didn't do this morning, or you will probably screw up tonight. It is never attacking you for what's happening in the present moment, ever. It's always like, why didn't you do this this morning? What are you going to mess up this evening? So staying in the present moment will begin to help you tremendously. And it comes down to the fact that if you're looking for the person in your life that's going to change your life or make you feel whole, you really better start looking in the mirror. Because no one can figure out what your, your all is except for you. And no one can quiet the mean voice in your head except for you, because no one can hear it except for you. And if you take these lies to heart or figure out what your own lies are, it will create real and lasting change in your life. This is not airy-fairy, sit on a mat and meditate and hope your life gets better. My life is fundamentally different than it was four years ago. I changed everything in my life with the exception of my house, my children, and my husband. Everything else was fair game. And I want to show you how, how dramatic the change is. Anybody use TimeHop, the app? Love this app. And it basically compares what you were doing on this very day X number of years ago. So this is real. Uh, from last Wednesday, five years ago, I was posting on Facebook, third time in seven days that I've flown out of Richmond airport. Why I was posting that on social media, I don't know. It just makes me feel sad and tired thinking about it. 
But one year ago, on the exact same day, four years later, I was at an all-expense-paid women's leadership retreat in Scottsdale, Arizona, meditating on the front lawn. Like, real change. Real, lasting change that now makes me feel very whole. The other example, five years ago, fell asleep during my massage today, expensive nap. <laughs> Again, it was like a pity party on social media, clearly. But one year ago, that's my business partner, Lauren Fitzgerald, and we are working at my parents' river house um, on the Rappahannock River on a really big client project for the mom complex. And I've always said that the mom complex is never going to have an office in New York and Chicago. Our second office is going to be on the Rappahannock River on my parents' front porch, because that's what Millie's would do. And so this is real, lasting change. I'm happier than I've ever been. I'm more whole than I've ever been. And it is such dramatic, fundamental, like amazing life. And it is so much better on the other side. When you live your life for you, you can feel less broken and more whole. And I will leave you with uh, the notion of namaste. Again, I don't even know who I am anymore. I'm like talking about tofu and namaste. But the notion of namaste is that the light inside of me sees and honors the light inside of you. And when you are broken on the inside, it's a pretty dark place to be. So now I am lit up from the inside, and I hope that um, me sharing my story will help you see and honor the light inside of you as well. So thank you for having me, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have.